it would help if whilst I'm talking is if you've actually got the um, the assignment brief open um, so that as we go through it you can uh, as I go through it you can draw your own attention to the various bits and pieces that are on it all right so the first thing to say is that when is it due in um, your paper is due in on Monday the 29th of November at 2 p.m. Don't be late because you end up losing 10% of your marks if you're a second over that 2 p.m. thing. And then um, you lose another 10% if you're 24 hours late as, as well. So if you're two days, or it's, but actually it's probably only 36 hours. If you're 36 hours late, you've lost 20% of your 20 marks off what you've done, um, which is, it's, it, it's awful really, um, but it does happen. Now, if you feel for whatever reason you are gonna be late, you're gonna miss the deadline, is that get in touch with the administration people and see whether or not you can wangle a um, extension. I can't give you extensions, I'm afraid to say it's not within my gift, it sits with the managers of the program. If it was left to me, I'd just give everybody extensions and then the problem with that is that nobody ever progresses and the thing is that if you just keep bumping things forward and forward and forward and forward is that we end up missing exam boards and that means that you can't graduate so deadlines for essays are sort of like sacrosanct we try and get feedback to you within 15 working days but that's an aspiration on our part and it doesn't stop you from going forward to your degree yeah Missing deadlines does, us missing deadlines, and it see I know it sounds it's it sounds unfair, doesn't it? But it's just the way that the system works. Um, the the university works. Um, is it fair to say on behalf of, for the benefit of the faculty rather than for the benefit of the students? To an extent, um, I suppose it does. But just appreciate that deadlines are different. Deadlines for exams need to be set. Um, deadlines for returning feedback are kind of like aspirations on our part but i'll do my level best to to as will everybody else um, and if we can't get them back there'll be a good reason as to why we can't get them back on time but before we end out feedback is that not only have i marked it provided you with feedback somebody's moderated it as well so it's been looked at twice and then before you graduate somebody will look at it again which will be the external examiner so it's quite a laborious pro or time time consuming process it can be and if if you haven't got a clear run at doing it um perhaps we don't get them out on time and i think that maybe you would rather that we spent time marking your papers properly rather than just knocking them out anyway so it's 29th of november it's almost like i'm getting my apology in first isn't it it's not the case i should do my level best to get the feedback to you as soon as i possibly can do now the other thing that you'll notice from it is it's worth 75 percent of your final grade so it's important and it's 3,000 words now 3,000 words is not a massive amount of words but it's a hefty amount if you haven't written 3,000 words in a while or indeed at all um, and you'll know is that you can't do it in a weekend well you can but it'd be crap so give yourself time to write your, pa write your paper properly uh, I would say that if you can write somewhere between two or three hundred words if you can write 300 words a day 350 words a day you're not doing too bad at this early stage in your career which means that actually it's going to take you a good week and a half to write your paper properly now that means that you'd write say in the morning and you give yourself a slot of time to be able to write your 350 words and then the rest of your days you you can do whatever you want for the rest of your day i do all my writing between 7 30 in the morning and 10 o'clock in the morning and then I've got the rest of the day that I can do something else with. If you're just sitting there and you've got to plough out a thousand words and a thousand words and a thousand words, you'll hate it. And you won't do good work if you hate it. If you're enjoying it, you'll do better work. So plan backwards and then decide when you're going to, you need to start writing your paper and get ahead of the game. And in this instance, get your parts one and two drafted before the workshop. Okay, and that will be helpful for you to do that so let's after following that the, the 3,000 words 75 percent is that you get a lot of gubbins about how you should you should submit it and it formatting as long as I can read it I don't care but people can get very finicky about these sorts of things um, 
and then we get to the introduction, which is the interesting bit, okay? And so what does the introduction say? It says, you're required to write 3,000 word reflective practice paper using appropriate module concepts from the module you from the unit. Now, the appropriate module concepts, there's two parts. There's the reflexive elements of it, and then there's the leadership elements of it. So we would be looking for you to build a paper around those concepts. And it's applied to a real leadership issue in your own work experience. Now, as I said to you before, that could be you as a leader, or it could be you as a follower, or it could be something that you've observed. It's a fairly broad church. If you're in any doubt, just give me an email and say, I'm thinking about doing this, and I'll say, yep, yeah, or I'll say, don't. But in my experience, there's very, very few things that I can't say don't do that from, providing that you're learning something from the context, it should be fine. Um, and then it says on the introduction, a full explanation and guidelines of this paper follow. And broadly speaking is what that is, is that we just outline what the paper is about. And the paper has got five parts to it. So we would want to see a paper that comprises five distinct parts. Yeah. You can call them subheadings, you can call them part A, B, C, D, and E, or you can call them part one, two, three, four, and five. It's up to you, it makes no difference. But just make sure that there's five parts into it. Okay, so it's not a conti and the, the five parts they do connect with each other. So they, they should they, they should relate to each other rather than being five distinct small little vignettes or four little essays. It should it should cohere into one one whole. Um because it's a reflective practice paper, it's going to be different from anything that you've ever written before, I would imagine. So give yourself some time to read the brief, understand the brief. And if you're in doubt, there is a tutorial after the workshop, which allows us to talk about the assignment and for you to raise any questions. Yeah. Failing that, send me an email and I will respond back to you. OK. Now, because this is your first paper, I'm quite, um, I'm quite happy. That's the right word. I am happy to provide you with formative feedback on your paper. Now, <laughs> that doesn't mean say that you can write a draft and then send it to me and say, "What do I think?" Because I'll just send it back to you and say, "Well, it's a draft. I can't mark that." Because I've been marking my own work. I've been marking it twice, and the university frowns on secondary marking. But if you wanted to send me an outline of what you were going to write about, so a couple of bullet points on each part, then I can look at that and I can comment on that quite happily. And I will do that. Yeah. What I don't like is I don't like a load of random stuff that's been sent to me. And then somebody you sort of like, so here's some stuff. They said, this is what I'm thinking. That, that, and it could be, you know, lots of different bits and pieces and it doesn't cohere properly. And so what do I think? Well, I think that it's your paper and you should write what you want. But if you're very clear about what it is that you want to do and how you're going to do it and your concepts and all the rest of it, and you send me an outline of that paper, I'm very pleased to comment on that. And, and I'll do it more than once if need be, particularly at this early stage in your master's, uh, in your diploma uh, qualifications. OK, so uh, getting into good habits, I think, is um, is important at this stage. But as you go through your diploma, you'll be expected to become more self-contained, more reliant and be able to critique your own work. But that's not the case at this stage. I know where you are in your careers. OK, and I'll give you um, some leeway as a consequence of that. I can't give you any leeway when it marked when I'm marking it. Either it's the standard or it doesn't. But I can give you some leeway in terms of providing you with feedback in terms of your progress and your your understanding and so on and so forth. I'm also quite enthusiastic about this subject, so I'm quite happy to talk about references and all that sort of stuff. You know, now let's just say a word about referencing. It, Harvard is the school standard, all right? So have a go. Because if you don't, if you're not clear on Harvard, go to the Harvard Guide, which sets it out for you. But you still might make one or two errors in in referencing convention that's fine it's to be expected and I can put you straight in the feedback but it's not it's not a big issue I'd rather you reference stuff and got it wrong than not reference anything at all yeah 
but use Harvard. Don't use that sort of like one and here's a footnote and all that sort of stuff because that's just awful. And I mark them on a screen, you see, and it just means I have to keep tabbing up and down and backwards and forwards and it's just bloody awful. So use the Harvard thing, even though it might be not be natural to you. Get into that bit of it because you're going to use it for the two years that you're on you doing your degree. And then there's some stuff about reflective practice papers, and it says that it's a dynamic learning framework to help you structure your reflective processes around your current role and responsibilities. And it helps you to learn from your own experiences, to reflect in a positive way. And the way that we would do that is that we would, and this is worth paying attention to and getting to grips with, is that we would reflect on our experiences through the literature, through the core concepts in order to inform what we do in the future in hopefully a better way. So we're using the literature to reflect upon experiences and to inform our future practice, in other words, to get better at what we do. And as far as this context is concerned, or this module is concerned, is getting better at being a leader. Um, the core of the assessment is concerned with enriching, challenging and reconstituting your existing knowledge to allow you to develop insights that will have a positive impact upon you as a leader. You can tell I've just read that from the from the brief, but I mean it. That's what it's about. So it's five parts. So what I'll do now is that I'll outline the five parts. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it in a way that I would approach this paper, which doesn't mean to say that you have to approach it in this way because there are that nobody's got a monopoly on truth in these things. You can do it in the way that you see fit or approach it in a way that you see fit. OK, it's no hard and fast about what appears in A and B and C and so on and so forth. As long as it makes up a coherent paper, then I'm OK with that. But be aware is that not every tutor that you work with on the program will will approach the the assignment even though the assignment might look the same they might not approach it in exactly the same way so listen to what people have got to say and if you're in any doubt ask yeah because it's just so that you're clear about what it is that you're attempting to do <clears throat> excuse me so there's five parts so we'd expect to see five sections the first part is what's known as the delegate in work role. I'm on page four now on the brief. So the delegate in work role says in this section, you're asked to pose structured questions about your current work role and appropriate prior experience. It should include. Now, when it says it should include, broadly speaking, is they're just guidances. The questions are there to guide you. So the delegate in work role is the what's the what's the job? What's the issue? So provide me with a context and then set out what the actual issue is that you want to explore. Yeah, your leadership case study, in other words. And I said that can come from whichever part of the leadership relationship you want it to come from. Leader, follower, observed, member of a team even, you know, which follower, I suppose, or member of a group rather than a team. It could come from any of those. But you would set it out in terms of context, issue, why it's a problem, yeah, or why, why it's an issue. You know, just justify the reasons as to why you're writing about that paper. Now, what do people do in that area? What they do wrong in that area is they give me a CV or lots of data about the firm and that our mission and our vision. And it's the number one at this and it's that, this, that and all the rest of it. And frankly, it don't matter. And I'm not interested. I want to understand the context and I want to understand you within that context and what the issue is. So forget the CV and the biography and, the, and, and about the firm and about yourself and just give me what I need to know in order to be able to understand your context and the issue as it is. Now, the more you can make this real, the more I'll believe you. I'm, we're asking you or we're privileging you in your information, aren't we? You can say, oh, I could just make this up. And you're right, you could. But my guess is that it wouldn't be very convincing if you were to try and make it up. And I'll probably say probably. I reckon I'll be able to see through it. So convincing is really the nub of this. Make it real. All right. So that's the first part. And then it does say within this section, you're advised to consider the following questions. They're there as to guide you. Okay. It's not 
it's not a requirement of the of the uh, of this reflective practice paper um but they might help you just to look at them and reflect upon them okay and then it says there are and it does this as it goes through there are bits and pieces that are in this paper that says this should this section should be written in the first person this section should be written in the third person and frankly i'm not bothered okay is that some sections lead themselves to writing in the first person better than other sections so i would tend to write section two which is about the core concepts in the third person because you're trying to ape academia academic literature reviews and they're usually written in the third person so i'd do that and then the rest of it i'd either write in the first person or in the third person but i'd be consistent as i was as, as i was going through it does that make sense you know so it's, it's sort of like sounds a bit odd when you sort of like say well paul did this so that's me you know, so why can i not say i did this and you can absolutely but I would make a distinction between the second part, part B. <coughs> is it part B or is it part two? Yeah, part B and the others. All right. And then part B. Part B is module concepts and principles. So it requires you to research more deeply and fully understand the concepts and principles appropriate to whatever the issue is that you're trying to work out. Essentially, it's a literature review. Now, for those of you from science backgrounds or work in science or are clinicians or anything like that, a literature review is a, a review of all of the existing literature that's pertinent to your problem or the issue or the research. Well, you can't do that here, can you? Because you've only got 3,000 words. So it's a focused literature review and it's a critical literature review. Well, what does that mean? That means that the literature is not always going to tell you everything that you need to know about your particular area. So, And there might be things in there that you just say, well, that doesn't meet my experiences. Well, it's OK for you to draw those out. It's OK for you to say, well, this guy says this, but this guy says that. And they seem to contradict each other. And that's fine as well. Yeah, what I wouldn't do is to go out, start criticising papers for their method or for their epistemological foundations, the philosophical foundations, in other words, and those sorts of things. Or the author <coughs> is that you can assume that the stuff that you've taken from the literature has got legitimacy, it's robust, and, and, and that they are good papers. Yeah. And you'd probably take some from the practitioner literature and you'd probably take some from the academic literature. The practitioner literature being those literatures that are pertinent to your paper, to your industry. So if you're in healthcare, it might be from the King's Fund. There might be some professional journal that you might use as well um, and so on and so forth. But I would definitely privilege the academic literature, particularly in this module. All right. So what do people do wrong when they do the literature reviews? They just give me a, a description or a list of papers. And that's not necessarily what we want. So they need to be able to they need to be able to help you examine the issue. So what I would do is I would let's say I'm doing identity and leadership. I'd write all my papers out in identity. I'd probably organize them thematically. And then at the end of it, I'd do a summative paragraph and bring it all together and say why it's important to the issue that I'm trying to look at. How does it relate? Yeah. And then it says, it gives you an idea about, you should be using um, 10 academic journals and five professional journal sources. Well, all right, that's a good rule of thumb, about 15, but you can use more and you can use less if it's a good, powerful piece of work. So don't get wrapped up over the numbers. It's just have you built a good enough, a comprehensive enough understanding of the concepts underneath the issue. Yeah. And if you've done that, then you're done. And then, again, there's a series of questions that, you, that, that are there in order to provoke your understanding or provoke your thought or your processes in terms of what you're doing. Now, the A and the B, they're the ones that I would like you to have got a handle on by the time that we do the... Um, do the workshop and that's a big ask I think but don't feel that it needs to be complete or finalized I think if you've got a good idea about what your issue is and you've got a good working set of literature and you've got some notes then I think you're in a good place 
because from the workshop onwards is that you might well go back and want to refine all your thoughts, refine the issue and give yourself some flexibility in order to be able to do that. Hopefully that makes sense. So post workshop is then you're going to come back, re-edit or re-finish off parts one and two, which shouldn't take you too long, one hopes, and then you're into parts C, D and E. Part C is a reflective assessment. It's the ideas and insights. It's about linking your theory to practice. And it's the core of the paper. It's where you're required to connect parts A and B and to generate new insights. So that's kind of like saying, this is my issue. This is, the, this is the literature. And you look through the literature into your issue and it might say to you, and, and it might give you an insight into what's expected to happen or what didn't happen, yeah? The literature says that this should have happened, but this happened, oh. But really it's, what did you learn? What have you learned here? What are the insights? You know, What have you learned from the process of doing this particular paper? Because the paper itself is a, a an, an aid and a guide. It's a developmental tool. It's not just a, yeah, this is important. It's not just a develop. It's not just a um, you writing down stuff that you know. Okay, it's a development. It's it's a development tool as well. So you should learn things from the process of processes of writing your paper, and the process that I would argue that's pertinent is one of praxis, P R A X I S in that we are asking you to engage in paraxiological study, which is the word of the day. Don't worry, we'll do this in the workshop and we'll explain it then, okay? So you connecting parts A and B to generate, generate insights into how you could lead more effectively or how you've led badly in the past or what you've learned from observing and reflecting upon other people, yeah? And again, there's a set of questions, but the questions are there to guide you. They're not there for you to, to answer all of them, because if you were to answer all of them, for goodness sake, the paper would be three and a half, 30,000 words long. And then K, uh, uh, K, where's that come from? I'm losing the plot here. D, that's more like it, isn't it? Is that key learning points and actions. So section summarizes your learning through reflective practice process and identifies potential routes for implementing changes. Lessons learnt, you, the team, the organization might actually list out some recommendations. You might actually want to think about putting in an action plan for implementing your kind of change. Now, for those of you that think that, you know, it needs to be a smart plan, which is sometimes what you'll get in all this. I don't really see how that's going to work within leadership because actually what we're doing and we're developing is you or the team and so on and so forth. So when you do, is make it real and make it specific. I'm going to do this, but be specific about what it is rather than sort of like some kind of nebulous concept about, well, I'm really going to improve my leadership style or I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I need to communicate more. Let's, let's, what does that mean? You know, so give it some meaning and give it context and make it specific and make it real. It doesn't mean to say that it needs to be that smart type thing. It just needs to be real, believable, convincing. And then the next section is section E, which is the critical reflection. Now, people have a tendency to say, well, that must therefore, because I'm getting to the end of it, this must now be the conclusion to my paper. Well, that's not correct is that your conclusion to your paper was what you've learned and what you're going to do about it how you're going to develop the critical reflection sits slightly outside of the paper and that's a critical review of the process of preparing your paper and writing it so how the experience of doing the paper has developed your competence in terms of the standards so the aim really here is what did you learn from doing the process and how is that going to shape what you do in the future? Not what what is the reflection on the paper itself. So the paper itself might well say, or a reflection on the paper might well be, um, <clears throat> well, I really need to do my literature review a bit early. Um, that's, that's not what we're looking at here. It's more about what you've learned about you through doing the paper. Yeah, And if you focus upon that and it's nicely reflexive, 
then you'll be in a good place. Okay. So following that, as you go down onto page seven, is that they give you a table which gives you a indicative word targets for each section. And that's what they are, again, they're indicative. But it's 500 words for the first part, then 1,000 words for parts B and C, 300 for part D, and 200 words for part E, which gives you 3,000 words in, 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 uh, in total. Now, the important bits there are where all the words are, aren't they? Which is B, C. And within your word total, 3,000 words, is that it's a school standard to offer plus or minus 10%. So really, your paper can be 2,700 words to 3,000 words, 3,300 words. But let's be honest, if you can't write 2,700 words on you as a subject in your leadership, why are you on the course? So I would start at 3,000 words and I'd work my way up to 3,300 words. And I'm not counting them. I will go by whatever Turnitin says. And if Turnitin says it's 3,390 words, I don't care. If it says it's 5,000 words, you're going to say, well, oh, this is a bit long. And then you, you could probably incur penalties for doing that. So it's easier for you to write 5,000 words than it is to write 3,000 words because the 3,000 words means to be, it, needs, it means it needs to be very focused. Yeah. Now, what people do wrong at the beginning of the essay is that they say, I'm going to look at my leadership style whatever that means and then they go and say well here's a literature review and then they'll cover situational leadership behavioral theories they'll cover transformational leadership and so on and so forth and say that but they're not styles they're theories the style exists within the theory is it and what is it about the style that you want to look at so when you start to look at leadership in all of its glory all up here there's a massive amount of it you need to really funnel it down into something which is quite specific which means that you're on a journey of a process of improvement about your leadership is that you're not going to improve it dramatic. Well, you could improve it dramatically, but you're not going to resolve all of the dilemmas and the conundrums that exist within your leadership practice within one paper. So think about this as a start, because then if it's specific, then you can tailor the, the literature specifically to your issue. And then it's easier to draw out the learnings and it's easier to draw out the recommendations and, you, and so on and so forth. And it's easier for you to then think about your future leadership and where you're going. Developing leadership's a journey, right? It's not something that you're going to do like that. It takes a lifetime to become more accomplished at it. And treat it in that way. And enjoy it, yeah? What pe most people enjoy talking about themselves and really that's what you're doing in a leadership practice in a, re a leadership reflective paper the challenge is is that you're looking at yourself you're kind of like stepping outside of yourself to look back at yourself objectively critically what you really are and that's the challenge and if you can do that you'll be all right take care